Hey, you listen to podcasts. Can I assume you like audiobooks as well? And if so, can I please hope you're not a member of Audible.com yet? I've been a member for over 10 years, and now I've joined their affiliates program, which means you can get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial and support Bionic Planet by going to audibletrial.com forward slash Bionic Planet. That's Bionic Planet is one word with no dots, dashes, or spaces because the system doesn't seem to accept those. And you can support me by signing up and checking out their services. It might even work if you're a member. I don't think it does, but give it a try. They've got over 180,000 titles for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Over the past year, a global partnership of environmental NGOs, governments, and businesses called Tropical Forest Alliance 2020 has been piecing together a list of 10 activities that can be scaled up right now to slash deforestation by 2020. They unveiled those activities last month at an event co-hosted by Forest Trends and the Consumer Goods Forum. I harvested audio from that event for episode 23 of Bionic Planet, and today's show is a byproduct of that event. It is, for the most part, just raw audio. If you're one of those wonderful people who supports the podcast via donations at bionicplanet.com, you will not be charged for this, but you can thank my employer, Forest Trends. They've agreed to let me use some company time to put these together. Man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. There's a group of us now who are proposing that the Earth has actually entered a new epoch, and that is the Anthropocene. We know that the enemy is carbon, and we know it's ugly face. We should put a big fat price on it, and of course, add to that, drop the subsidies. Earth, we broke it, we own it. And nothing is as it was. Not the trees, not the seas, not the forests, farms, or fields. And not the global economy that depends on all of these. But we can restore it, make it better, greener, more resilient, more sustainable. But how? Technology? Geoengineering? Are we doomed to live on a bionic planet, or is nature itself the answer? That's the question we address in every episode of Bionic Planet, a podcast of the Anthropocene, the new epoch defined by man's impact on Earth. And today we're examining 10 actions that we can take right now to purge tropical deforestation from commodity supply chains by the year 2020, two years from now. That's huge because deforestation generates anywhere from 11 to 20 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions and agriculture drives most of that deforestation. Today's episode is different from most. I didn't edit the audio except to adjust volume levels here and there, and I don't inject to pontificate, proselytize, or prognosticate the way I usually do, except towards the end where they cut away to a video that you obviously won't be able to see through your ears. I think today's show could be a great resource if you've either heard episode 22 and want more details, or if you're a long-standing member of the Land Use Echo Chamber. If you're coming in cold and find yourself lost, then I suggest you go back to episode 22, where I trimmed a lot of digressions and layered in some of my invaluable insights, or download the report that this is based on. It's eminently readable, and it's called Commodities and Forests Agenda 2020, 10 Priorities to Remove Tropical Deforestation from Commodity Supply Chains. You can find a link in the show notes for both this episode, which is episode 23, or in the previous episode, episode 22, at bionic-planet.com. If I can encourage people to please uh, take your seats. The show is about to begin. First, huge uh, congratulations to everybody that's been able to arrive here and, and navigate New York City at this crazy week. Um, what we're going to do this afternoon is um, really celebrate the launch of a new report that's come out that's, um, that's been produced by the Tropical Forest Alliance. Marco is here with us that um, looks at commodities and forests and an agenda for 2020. And um, 
for me, what's interesting about this, there are, there are a lot of folks in this room that have been a part of initiatives that are all um, in and around that, that idea. But what's interesting to me about this report is that it feels like we've, um, we've taken the important step of moving from kind of tactical approaches to these issues to a much broader, more strategic approach. And, uh, and Marco and your team, congratulations on that. It's really, really important to us. And that's reflected in sort of the 10 priorities that they lay out there. So you need to be thinking about things like illegality, not only illegal timber harvesting, but illegal conversion of forest to agriculture. We did a report, we at Forest Trends, we did a report a couple of years ago that tried to document um, illegal, illegal conversion. And um, a conservative estimate at the end of this report when we looked at it globally was 90% of the commodities, agricultural commodities coming out of, out of the developing world into um, Europe and, and modern marketplaces, 90% was illegal. So it's a very important dimension of this is to think about legality. Obviously there are um, important developments around jurisdictional approaches, approaches where you start to think about um, not a particular business or a particular project, but you're starting to think about a, a larger scale approach to these issues like certification, where you're working at a state level or a federal level. Uh, those are gonna be very important developments. The businesses that are in this space that are leading have been um, pounding that drum, saying it's very, very difficult for them to operate when you are uh, certifying producer by producer. They need larger scale ways of of uh, demonstrating best practice. And that's another one of the uh, critical uh, priorities that's laid out here. The private sector commitments, obviously that's gonna be a, a central part of the conversation this afternoon. Um, we have been a partner in that. We have an initiative called Supply Chain where over the last four years we've been tracking commitments from businesses around the world and progress on those commitments. And um, I think one of the reasons that uh, a meeting like this is so important and some progress needs to be made is that, frankly, it's not very encouraging in terms of how much, uh, how close we're getting to those, those commitments for 2020. So we need to really re-strategize that. Community is a very important actor. So if you think about a forest landscape and you can take the example of the Brazilian Amazon, it's really, really important to be working with the drivers of deforestation, those large-scale commodities like soybean um, farmers and cattle ranchers. But the other side of that frontier is equally as important. We need to make sure that there are values and sustainable forest-based supply chains on that other side that benefit the local communities, that benefit the indigenous communities. In, in the Brazilian Amazon, there are 20 million people, 400 different ethnicities that are, that are truly the front lines of our battle to, to preserve the Amazon. So there needs to be this sort of mix of, of approaches, and I think that, again, is what this report does so well. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, maybe just close by saying that um, I think we're all sensing it here this week, and. Um, with all the things that are going on, it feels like we're in that, that you know, tale of two cities where, where you know, negotiators are sitting here saying, is climate change real? And Houston is underwater and Florida is underwater and they're, you know, Dominica is gone as far as we know and Puerto Rico is getting hammered and you know, Mexico. So all of these things are, I think, reminders to us of the urgency of the problem. And so um, I hope everybody here senses that urgency and, um, and takes that on and, and, um, and that we act in an urgent way. And we need to be acting in a, a smart, strategic way, again, as this report lays out, that integrates action that companies can, can do themselves or, or NGOs can do or states can do or countries to do, but truly start to, to weave that picture together so that our actions are, are of scale and impact that are gonna be significant. Um, and, um, I was talking with somebody late last night after too many beers, and, and what, we, what we ended up talking about is what we really need to do is we need to activate the action figures so that we can move on with this game and succeed. Marco, thank you again for this report. Let me uh, turn it over to you. Thank you.
Thank you, Michael, and thank you uh, to Forest Trends to being such good partners in organizing this event and, and many other things that we have done over the lot. Uh, what feels like a long time, but actually short time, we have had a Tropical Forest Alliance Secretariat. I thought we'd just give a very, very brief introduction for those who don't know TFA 2020, the Tropical Forest Alliance 2020, who we are. I'm Mark Albani, I'm the director of the Alliance, or actually the director of the Secretariat which is hosted at the World Economic Forum. We're basically a platform for public-private collaboration around the issue of commodity-driven deforestation. And uh, this is an alliance that was actually created originally by the US government working with the Consumer Goods Forum, which is our co-host for this event, which is an umbrella organization of over 400 companies. And in 2010, the Consumer Goods Forum passed a resolution that they would end deforestation in their supply chains for beef, soy, paper and pulp, and palm oil by 2020. And then there was a discussion basically saying, well, actually, this is not something that the business sector can do on its own and will need collaboration. And so this alliance was started. And since then it has grown. We have now over 100 partners. It's a multi-stakeholder alliance, multi-stakeholder platform. It does have government, both uh, con uh, consumer governments and tropical forest governments. It has uh, business, both producers, all the way up to uh, companies that uh, run plantations or the first buyers from, from farmers, to uh, processors, co uh, consumer packaged good companies, and then retailers, and has civil society. Civil society, indigenous people organizations, uh, environmental NGOs, uh, labor, and so on. Uh, and for the last two years, this platform has had a secretariat, uh, thanks to um, generous funding from the governments of Norway, the UK, and the Netherlands, and the secretariat is hosted the World Economic Forum in Geneva. I often told that we represent business, we don't. Actually, we represent this multi-stakeholder coalition, and actually most of our board is actually civil society and government, and business is actually a minority. Um, one of the things that we did was to support the uh, New York Declaration on Forest Assessment that came out last year, the deep dive on goal two. Goal two of the New York Declaration on Forests ending commodity-driven deforestation by 2020. So that was signed in 2014. Uh, many, many organizations signed up to actually support this goal. And the assessment was actually uh, a bit sobering. And uh, you can, there is a forestdeclarations.org, the report is still there. There will be coming an update soon uh, for what's happened in the last year, but hasn't changed very much. And the story is one that a lot of progress has been made. And frankly, when people made these commitments almost 10 years ago, they really didn't know what that meant and what, what, how to operationally get there. Uh, and a lot has been done to actually move ahead in this. And so. Companies have made commitments, they have created policies, they're implementing these policies and so on. At the same time, there's still a lot that needs to be done. And uh, 2020 is coming up, uh, and the progress has not been such that you actually feel comfortable that this goal will be met at the current pace. Uh, so out of that, discussing in our platform with the many stakeholders that we have, I will say, okay, so what, right? So yes, we can tear our hair out, that's not something I can do, but the others could do that. Uh, uh, or, you know, wh where do we go from here? Uh, and part of this was uh, the, the necessity to come up with this report. I have my prop, this uh, Commodities and Forest Agenda 2020, 10 priorities to remove tropical deforestation from commodity supply chains. So this is 10 areas that emerge from a process of, of engagement and, and discussion with, with stakeholders. Many, many stakeholders, over 250 organizations and individuals that gave input into this. And it, clearly this is not, you know, by standards of, uh, of like a public consultation process, you might say 250 people is not that many, but we also didn't want to take three years to come up with the report on what we need to do to end deforestation by 2020 because it's 2017, so we would come out with the report in 2020. Uh, so we had to move relatively fast, but we tried to be uh, quite inclusive and we had discussions both uh, with uh, your kind of expected environmental NGOs to put their in, in input into this, but we also had discussions in Jakarta, discussions in Sao Paulo, discussion in Ghana, uh, with the companies that are operating there, with the, with the domestic NGOs that are operating on these issues there, and so on. 
And what we try to put together is really what matters for global decision makers. If you are a CEO of a large company, if you are a asset manager of a very large pension fund, if you are the head of a government uh, that has actually a pretty long agenda, right? And deforestation is probably item number seven, if you're lucky, on your agenda, or maybe it's item number 10. What do you need to know? What are the, the things that you need to ask to your people? Are you actually paying attention to this? Are you actually paying attention to that? What are the issues? And this document tries to do that. This, from our consultation and supported by the analytics and run by our friends at, at Climate Focus, and then they'll present what actually it's inside it, are the 10 big issues, are the 10 big problems. They are not the only ones, but they are the ones that kind of scan, uh, uh, run across the, the, the whole gamut of the global supply chains that have big global impact. And of course, they're also the ones where we think that we need to move faster because 2020 is soon. There are other issues that are longer uh, and they need to be worked on as well. And they will need to be solved if we not only end deforestation or get as close as possible in the next two years, but actually um, want to sustain that. Because the reality of deforestation is that is not a thing that when you end it is ended. As long as you have forest, you have the possibility of deforesting. So you have to create the long-term equitable development opportunities that will remove the need for people to clear the forest. But these are basically the things that are most important in the short term. So you got to look at this, and, and Charlotte will present this in, with that kind of um, frame and, uh, and lens. This is the urgent stuff that we need to do to get as far as we can and as fast as we can towards the goal to 2020. I will stop talking because I've already gone over my five minutes and I will introduce our, our master of ceremonies for today's event, which is uh, Justin Adams, whom I don't see. Here he is in front of me. <laughs> I'm awfully observant, as you can say. Uh, Justin is the global manage, uh, is the managing director for Global Lands for the Nature Conservancy, and so he's also a board member for the Tropical Forest Alliance 2020, and a great thought partner for us. And we're very happy to have him here to run the show. Well, over to you, there, Justin. Thank you, Marco. I'm mic'd up. I get a special mic. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my job is to uh, uh, just try and run the sessions this afternoon, and we want to have a very informal session. We haven't got a big formal panel where we're going to have talking heads at the front, but what we want to invite is initially we're going to hear from Charlotte uh, and just running through the 10-point action plan uh, in a very short space of time, so just to give everybody an idea of what those 10 priorities are. Uh, we were then going to invite some contributions from 11 uh, 11 individuals in the, organ and, uh, the audience, all of whom are doing great work in the space from private sector, from civil society, from government, to put forward some very specific asks. And they are all going to be restricted to four minutes maximum. Uh, and I'm going to be bouncing up on the four minute mark to, uh, to get them to sit down so that, that it's all. But the idea is that we'll just get some rapid input from some thought leaders uh, and some you know, key organizations in the space. Uh, we'll see how we get on. There may be a chance for a little bit of Q&A, but we're not trying to get a lot of discussion because the main event actually is going to be the cocktails and the canopies that will be happening afterwards and the networking, which is always the best part of any of these types of gatherings. So really, that is the main event. But we want everybody to be really clear about making specific asks and having some real conversation. So why are you all here? And so we'll have a little bit of chance for reflection before we then step out uh, at the end. Uh, and so that will be happening in the, uh, in the atrium and running all the way through till 8 o'clock. So I'll talk more about that we, as we get closer. So that's really what I'm here to do. I'm going to make three very quick remarks before I invite Charlotte up. The first uh, is, actually I'm going to make four remarks. First is to thank TFA and Forest Trends for, for hosting this and bringing everybody together at Climate Week. There's so much buzz here as we all start thinking about these agendas and how they converge. So thank you uh, for, for bringing everybody together. Uh, the, then the, the, the key points that I would make is, firstly, there is no solution to the climate challenge unless we take the land use sector much, much more seriously. Second point, 
we are only going to get there by addressing some of the critical issues and taking, deforest taking the deforestation out of some of the key agricultural supply chains and commodity supply chains is one of the most important things that we can be doing. And then the third point is the only way we can succeed at doing that is by really thinking about new types of partnership because no single organization and no single sector can achieve this on their own. So this is really about how governments, together with private sector, together with civil society, come together to think about how we're going to create the solutions. And that really sits at the heart of why the Tropical Forest Alliance uh, was set up. We've got some very, very aggressive goals in terms of 2020. What we're going to hear now is 10 of the key priorities that set out a roadmap for how we have any chance of achieving those goals. So Charlotte, over to you. Thank you. The Commodities and Forest Agenda 2020. The objective of the agenda is to identify 10 priority areas for policymakers, company leaders, civil society leaders, to strengthen and accelerate progress to address commodity driven deforestation. Why we are doing this and the process has thankfully already introduced by Marco, by Michael and by Justin. What I want to say here, which is important, it is not a stepwise approach. We are not suggesting to do one and then the next one and then the next one. There is also no priority among the priority areas. What we are saying here is we have to do all of them and we have to start now. Okay? So the um, click and click. I need to. So, <laughs> so this is a fairly short document. It is written so that you and your bosses and your partners can read it in about an hour and you get the main, the gist of it. It is the result of a process that took almost a year. We started with the New York Declaration Progress Assessment on Goal 2 in November, which was released in November 2016. Then we had a series of workshops, consultations, consultations elect in electronic form, in person. We met first with a number of, of a multi-stakeholder group in Berlin in December 16. Then we went into a process of, a process of analysis. We had a lot of uh, individual calls with experts. Then we produced a draft in March that was consulted on during the General Assembly of, the, of, the T, of TFA 2020. Then we went back and rewrote it. So there was a lot of rewriting involved. And then we had consultations again in electronic format and in person in Indonesia, in Brazil, and in Ghana. Um, all this is important. It is a result of a collaboration. And as it is, it's, it will never make 100% everybody happy. But it is the agreement among the greatest you know, number of stakeholders what needs to happen. And that is click number one, the elimination of illegality from supply chains. Um, we had, so Michael already referred to the, to the forest trends report and that you know, the overwhelming majority of commodities sourced from developing countries is somehow associated with illegality. And if we look at tropical deforestation, about 50% of the commodities come from illegal sourcing. Um, more can be done to eliminate deforestation from supply chain. It needs to be a priority for companies. And companies can also, by making data available, support enforcement efforts of governments. Evidence shows it is effective. The, uh, the gains are in Brazil between 2004 and 2014, when Brazil did reduced uh, deforestation, about 70% is among us, others, is one of the main factors is improved enforcement. That doesn't mean that we have to wait until, again, until everything is illegal, is illegal before we can do all the rest, but it is essential. Next slide. Growing and strengthening palm oil certification. Palm oil is one of the main drivers of deforestation, in particular in Southeast Asia and in West Africa. 
It is also one of the commodities where a, where a certification has gained traction. About 21% of palm oil supply is RSPO uh, certified, so that's the roundtable for sustainable palm oil. That is a good start, but it needs to, to have impact. It needs to be strengthened, accelerated, and improved. Demand, the demand side needs to be, uh, uh, there needs to be increased demand from consumer governments and companies to address what we have at the moment, a de demand gap. So we don't even have sufficient in demand for the 21% that is certified. But the standards also need to be improved to cover more forest and, um, and prioritize uh, forest areas. Next slide. Scaling up pilot programs for sustainable intensification of cattle grazing. Now we move from Southeast Asia and West Africa with a priority region palm oil to, uh, to Latin America where, where beef is the, the most important driver of deforestation and generally beef is responsible for more deforestation than palm oil, soy, soy and pul uh, pulp and paper combined. So it is a priority. B demand for beef is, continues to grow and increased. We know that we can satisfy existing and growing demand on a smaller land area. There are pilots, pilots are tested, and they need to be accelerated um, in, and, and scaled up. Next slide. Sustainably increasing smallholder yields in palm oil and cocoa. More than 30% of palm oil and more than 90% of cocoa is produced by smallholders. And these smallholders lack access to credit, they lack training, they, um, and often because of this they go and mine soil and land and, and, uh, to increase yields. This can be changed by systematically improving smallholder yields by providing technical assistance, training, and, uh, and making available special finance facilities. There is also you know, aggregation of smallholders, all that needs to happen. It's very important, it's very essential for the palm oil supply chain and for the cocoa supply chain. Um, next slide. Achieving sustainable soy production. Soy is one of the primary causes for destruction of natural ecosystems. Forest, but also natural savannas and uh, forest, uh, 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 nat other native and natural ecosystem. It is the main driver of deforestation and con land conversion in the Brazilian Cerrado, where it has converted nearly 30 million hectares of natural ecosystem between 1990 and 2010. The global demand for soy continues to raise. Very little of it is, is certified. It's also a lot of it goes to uh, emerging economies. And in order to save the remaining ecosystem of the Cerrado and other native ecosystems, it is important that multi-stakeholder initiatives like Moratoria or others are being formed in support of these ecosystems. Next slide. Acceleration of, uh, accelerating the implementation of jurisdictional programs. We know that more and more governments, subnational and national, have embarked in processes of land planning and uh, uh, drawn out, drawing up investment plans that move towards a sustainable landscape and rural development. We have uh, screened about you know, tw 34 of these jurisdictions. They cover significant amount of existing commodity production. That is 10% of the world's beef production, 34% of the world's palm oil production, and 40% of the soy production globally. There is a momentum, and that momentum needs to be accelerated and strengthened. And where we have early successes, where public and private sector work together in jurisdictional program, program that need to be strengthened and, and so that it can serve as a pilot and model for other jurisdictions. Absolutely important because it brings a lot of the other pieces together. Next slide. Addressing land conflict, tenure security, and land rights. 
That's another of the agenda item, which is an underlying priority for an, a many of the other things, for example, the smallholder intensification uh, agenda item depends also on land title. Land title for rural communities is essential to make, you know, make them invest into land, but also making available credit and finance for land. Um, un uncertainty of, of a land title, title and registration holds back a lot of action and activity. So land registration efforts need to be accelerated. Conflict resolution mechanisms need to be put in place. And very important, the uh, land uh, needs to be assigned to indigenous peoples and rural communities where they have a claim. We know that ownership and management of lands by indigenous peoples is positive correlated with land forest protection. Next slide. Mobilizing demand for deforestation-free commodities in emerging markets, a big and important thing, agenda item, which has been neglected um, for the longest time. But as long as China is the world's lar largest importer of, of soy pulp and paper, and pulp and paper progress, the third largest importer of palm oil, and an increasingly important importer of beef, it is essential, essential to engage China, and uh, Indonesia is by far the most important importer of palm oil, also essential for engagement. In addition to this, we also need to keep an eye on domestic demand in emerging economies, something that came up in all three regional consultations. So it is not only those, but it is also the producing producing. Uh, uh, countries. Positive, this is feasible. We have more and more initiatives that, um, that involve China and India, and this is something that we, you know, as a community need to engage and strengthen and partner with these players. Next slide. Redirecting finance towards deforestation uh, free supply chain. So there is finance. We have trillions in agricultural finance, but at the moment it is not you know, not, not all of it, you know, or some, you know, um, is used in the sustainable way. The overwhelming majority is not. If we compare this to actually, you know, sustainable uh, finance and initiative, it is minuscule compared to baseline or gray finance, as we call it. Um, so it is very important to shift and redirect these financial, these financial streams. And here, new finance, new government levers, redirecting of subsidies and impact finance can uh, have a very important role to redirect this finance, these fi uh, the, uh, finance, the streams of finance. Next one. And finally, last but not least, uh, is data. We need to improve quality and quantity, and we need to do better in sharing uh, supply chain data. There is a lot has happened in this area. A lot of NGOs and a lot of this group in the room have been essential partners in making more data available. But the existing uh, NGO initiatives are still insufficiently linked to what companies do. Companies can use these data better, but there are also still data gaps that need to be addressed. And finally, what would, um, uh, what would also help in, in the cooperation on transparency is a common set of, of um, definitions that help us all to speak the same language. These are the say, 10 points. And with that, I pass it on again to Justin. Great. Well, stay standing, Charlotte, because oh. we just want to have a few minutes for any clarification questions. Please, no grandstanding or any big sort of point. But any clarification questions for Charlotte on this 10-point uh, priority plan? Read it. And we have mics. Where are the mics? Michael yeah. at the back, please. One here. Just say your name and affiliation. Hi, I'm Michael Radder, Mayor, Executive Director of Code Red. Um, the jurisdictional programs you refer to, are those um, standalone jurisdictional programs or are they with uh, jurisdictional red programs? They are not all red programs. They are focused initially, the initial ones that we looked at were red focused, but there are a number that focus more specifically also on supply chains. So these are all jurisdictional programs that have a focus on forest and supply chains. 
Not all, not all, are, not all of them are red programs. Hi, thank you. Uh, Gemma Tillak from Rainforest Action Network. Uh, when you're talking about redirecting finance to sustainable production systems, has there been much thought or consultation around the scale of those systems and whether or not shifting from the large-scale plantation model to small-scale locally controlled systems is a preferable way to go? Well, part of it, we already uh, respond with the action agenda because one important core, you know, core, demo, you know, pro identi uh, priority item here is to support smallholder systems. So um, that is essential. Same, you know, with the sustainable grazing system. We also see a lot, um, a lot of opportunity around um, agroforestry systems and restoration. We have the whole restoration agenda, which is an uh, an an, uh, an um, investment opportunity, but when it comes to you know we don't go into the detail in this where we say exactly this needs to be financed. We hope that this triggers you know working groups you know whether it's in TFA or another context that then translate this into action plans. But smallholders are a clear priority. I think we are very unambiguous about this. And just to say, TFA has actually had a very good working group looking at finance, and some of those reports are available, so including yeah. finance for smallholders. Any other at the back there, please? Hi, um, Omar from Global Council. Um, point on uh, priority number 10 on definitions. Do you think you could just share a little bit more as to, as to how that might come about? which organizations might be shaping them and how we might try and reach some agreement on them. I think we, this is actually an agenda item which in a certain way has at least, you know, the first steps have been taken to address it while we were working on it. And Rainforest Alliance is coordinating a group of NGOs that uh, work on what we call the accountability framework, where this is one of the goals. And I think Nicole will present that, right? Yeah. yeah it's not just NGOs. It's it's, oh, cross, it's, it's a cross-sector thing to, to, to sort of come up with those definitions. Turns out defining what a forest is is more complicated than, yeah. than, uh, than we might realize. More questions? One at the front here. Um, <clears throat> Brando Crespi from Pronatura. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that some 20%, uh, percent, 70 plus percent of palm oil is certified. But you also added something which was intriguing, that is that that palm oil is not being absorbed by the market. Yeah. Could you, uh, is it a question of price? Is it a question of there's not enough demand on the part of consumers for certified palm oil? Um, um, at the moment, let's say there is um, the demand is growing, the supply is growing, and they don't find together. Also, at the moment, it is. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, yeah. Um, do, can you explain a bit more on the? Okay. Yeah. So that's you know TFA. So, so some of the issues are, and then there's. Probably a lot of people know more about palm oil than I do in this room, but one of the issues with palm oil is that palm oil gets refined in a whole bunch. It's, it's like oil, right, in some ways. Yeah. It gets refined, and then people use different components of the palm oil. So what happens is that might be demand for, let's say you want a highly refined component and you want it certified, but nobody do, that wants the unrefined component wants it certified. Mm. So that's part of the issue, is that fundamentally there are different utilization. And... Uh, uh, one of the other things that comes up is that one of the uh, toughest certification requirements was actually for use of palm oil in the, bio, uh, the biodiesel industry. But what we're going to see now, if, if the European Union actually gets palm oil out of the directive, is that we'll see even more certified. Palm. So some of this palm oil is certified under a different standard. So we'll have two different certification. And if it's bought as biodiesel, it doesn't show up in the RSPO accounting because the RSPO certification doesn't have the carbon, uh, doesn't have the carbon uh, standards that will allow it to use as biodiesel. But the urgency of this point is even higher in the face of potentially Europe getting out of, of uh, biodiesel palm oil, which, you know, you can, and I know there's a lot of people who think that's a good thing, that we shouldn't use palm oil as fuel, but at the same time what it means is there's a whole bunch of pal certified palm oil that is currently by, bought 
with very high certification standard that we're just going to actually go back onto the market and try to find a home. Yeah. So that's something which is a misconception in many markets in Europe is then people then decide not to, you know, avoid palm oil, which is not helping us because it's important to buy certified palm oil. So, <laughs> As ever, it's complicated. Was her, yeah. uh, we have time for one last question. So right at the back there. Thank you. Then I'm Agnetis, UNDP. Thank you for the presentation, and I look forward to reading the report in, uh, in detail. Um, I think it's lovely to see these uh, 10 action points coming out so clearly um, and, and giving us a clear direction. On the other hand, there are also action points in, on which we've been working in this community uh, for, for various years. So how, what do you feel? What is different now? What is the, the momentum that we have that you think can turn these action points into actually actionable points that, uh, that can make a, a difference with the experience that we have till now. Why is the time right now? We think, um, so we know that is a, there is initiatives on all of this. And in fact, one of the filter that we applied is that we wanted to suggest something that is feasible and where is already something happened. So what can be accelerated. So, but, and we know all these different groups working on it. The hope is by, you know, authoring a document which has support and is readable by CEOs, policymakers, you know, at the higher level. Whenever there is groups coming together and identifying priorities, they can reference to it. They can also say, you know, who is doing what and develop this in actually coordinated public-private you know, action plans. This is not something what we are doing, but that should be the reference or the framework that allows this next step to be taken. And certainly, you know, TFA may be helping with that, other groups. Um, that is the hope that this will facilitate. So I would just add that I don't think we've made clear that I don't, anybody's saying that this is easy, right? So this is still some really, really hard yards that we've got to work together on. But I think the moment that we have now in time is where you've got genuinely new partnerships between private sector, government, civil society coming together. You've got the TFA hosted at the World Economic Forum. So these conversations are happening at Davos with CEOs, with ministers, and there's a genuine opportunity to build and harness some of that energy. And so it's, it's not that it's easy, but that we've got to use that momentum to now turn it in. So. With that, I'd like you all to give me uh, some round of applause for Charlotte. Thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a really good report. It's very well written. I would encourage you all to, uh, to read it and to share it. What I didn't say is you're all going to be tested on it before you have drinks and canopies later. So just 10 points. You maybe only need to remember five, but, but you'll be tested. So with that, we're going to move into the next, uh, uh, the next session. I need a mic. Uh, and this is the sort of quick, the quick draw round of where we've invited 11 speakers to just give a contribution about something they are doing. So it's going to be timed. They have four minutes. They know that in three minutes they will be handed a sign that says one minute to go. And if they then overstep the mark and go beyond four minutes, then I will have to stand up and intervene, which I'll do very politely in a very British way, but I will intervene nonetheless. So, <laughs> So uh, first up is uh, Kavita Prakashmani, uh, the uh, global uh, markets uh, and food lead from uh, WWF International and has an extremely esteemed career that I couldn't even begin to talk about, but uh, Kavita. Now that would take more than four minutes, so we won't do that. Um, hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here and of course we're very pleased to be supporting the TFA at the launch of this uh, agenda. Um, I'll take my four minutes to just do a quick wrap-up of what WWF has seen as its core contribution to this, uh, to this uh, very, very exciting space and very essential space. So about 10 years ago, we did an analysis of uh, what are the, causes of, the main causes of loss of habitat. Uh, of course, forests are one, but given that we are a World Wildlife Fund, we were also interested in looking at the other habitats which impact our 
wildlife species, our rivers, um, and so on and so forth. And we did an analysis and came up with a set of 15 commodities that were really causing deforestation and habitat loss. And since then, we've launched a market transformation initiative, which really helped us get our act together on what we do on those commodities. The ones most relevant for us here include soy and beef, uh, palm oil, pulp and paper, timber uh, products, and we also had uh, others like, like fish and sugarcane and cotton, but those are not relevant for a forest perspective. So what we did then was to say, what, what is the biggest intervention point to make a difference to how these crops and these commodities are produced, consumed, uh, distributed, traded? Uh, and we did this wonderful R glass, champagne glass figure, which said, you know, there are millions and millions of, of producers, about five, uh, five and a half, uh, 550 million uh, farmers. There are seven and a half billion consumers. Can't go to all of them. So let's go to those 500 companies in the middle that actually control most of that trade. And that's what we did. So we reached out to a lot of these companies. We got them to sign up to certification, to standards. We spent a lot of time designing, launching, supporting, strengthening certification schemes themselves, whether it's the RSPO, the RTRS, the BCI. I mean, you name them, we can go through the whole alphabet. Um, and I'm sure you all know them. Uh, and we really then went into saying, how do we transform markets? And a lot happened. So, right, we have 10 to 15 to 20% transformation of markets. RSPO, I think, at 21% of uh, RSPO in the world is now certified. So a lot of change happened. Uh, but it isn't enough. Right, so there are many things that we still need to do. So we shifted that to saying, what next? And we came up with the uh, collaboration for forests and agriculture, which is the CFA project, which you know TNC and many others are part of. Really looking at how do you take commodities in landscapes in countries like Brazil um, and uh, Paraguay, uh, and then link them into the market. So really looking at the full chain and saying, where does it go? Who do we need to influence? What value chain player can actually make a difference? And so we got to talking to people in uh, China, in Russia, who are buying the soy and the beef, uh, and obviously Europe and the US, to get those markets to shift. Uh, and so then we also looked at saying, OK, we're moving on this. We're looking at the production. We're looking at the value chains. Can we also look at the financing? So we started a financing work. Uh, and I have colleagues here who know more about it than me to really see how you can influence finance to go to where we want it to go. But in, the, in, in that context, we also started looking at saying, if you take something like palm oil, we might be at 21%, but the rest of that still goes into India and China and Malaysia. So we've now started looking at what we can do in the context of India, what we can do in the context of Malaysia itself to create the demand, to bring on companies, to find the business case, which may not get certified palm oil, but might at least get into better standards. Um, and then we've recently launched two big things with the uh, Global Environment uh, Foundation is the uh, Good Growth Partnership, really looking at some of these commodities and really looking at them in terms of the entire food, uh, the entire value chain system of them. Uh, and then the second is we've just launched our Serato Manifesto because we're really seeing that legality is not enough. Uh, the legal... Uh, requirement don't get us up to the uh, market change that we want. And so we really need to, I can see you, uh, Justin, uh, <laughs> we really need to get to the point where we go beyond the legal requirements into value chain and market demands. So my three asks are, <laughs> help uh, join us in signing the Serato Manifesto, join us in the Good Growth Partnership, join us in the CFA, uh, because we need markets to shift. Uh, we also call on you to help us look at how we change markets in China and India. And third, but we are looking at jurisdictional approaches. There is a Balik Papan uh, roadmap being launched by 30 subnational governments. So please all stand up and join because the question of how we make this happen will be through these partnerships. Thank Very you. good. Thank you, Gavita. <laughs> I was I was too soft on her. Uh, but Simon, uh, Simon Hall, is going to come and talk next. Simon's one of the, uh, the really great emerging leaders in this space. He works for the National Wildlife Federation, the senior manager on international wildlife conservation, but one of the key drivers of the collaboration on forest and agriculture. So Simon, four minutes. All right. I'm going to stick to the, the remarks that I prepared. Though. <laughs> So thanks so much. It's it's a real pleasure to be here, and, uh, and I'm just um, I'm just so happy to have the opportunity to to my four minutes up here and to to present and ask, which I think is a really um, interesting format. So for thanks for the organizers for putting that together. 
As Justin mentioned, my name is Simon Hall. I, I work for the National Wildlife Federation. I'm based in Washington, D.C. I manage NWF's uh, portfolio of work in Latin America focused on the key drivers of deforestation there, which we've heard from some of the other speakers, which are um, cattle and soy. We look at beef is obviously critically important, but we're looking at this more holistically across the, the suite of sort of products coming out of cattle production, leather, obviously hugely important, tallow, biodiesel, other things that are all sort of bundled into the, the value chain there. Um, a lot of my work focuses on advancing uh, uh, private sector um, interventions for uh, tr how to tackle deforestation. Um, and NWF has met a, a member of TFA for, for many years now, and it's been really great to see the increased level of collaboration and engagement that's been happening um, more recently. I think this is really critical. Um, there's, you know, there's not that much time left until 2020. We have these clocks around me here ticking away as we speak, so time is really of the essence. Um, you know, as some of the others have, have mentioned, NWF, TNC, WWF, and a whole suite of many other strategic partners are working together as part of the collaboration for forest and agriculture trying to tackle uh, deforestation driven by uh, cattle and soy in Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. And we're linked up with the accountability framework and other initiatives and br sort of, you know, bringing all these pieces together, um, working together lockstep to, to solve these problems. Um, one of the key pieces for, for um, NWS work right now as part of the, the collaboration that was mentioned, which also directly ties into the work of, of TFA's priority agenda that's been set forth, is the advancement of more transparent information systems and better supply chain traceability data. These are really critical. These underpin all of this work. Without that, it makes everything much more opaque. It's difficult to have visibility up and down the supply chain. It makes decision making more challenging, more question marks, more risk. Um, our collective efforts to tackle deforestation, particularly if I just spend a, a couple seconds on Brazil, really hinge on the availability of and access to this type of critical supply chain information. Um, and for them to, for these efforts to really be successful, these systems that are, many of which are already in place, really need to be unlocked in a more meaningful way so that supply chain actors who are making decisions at the margin are able to make the most informed decisions reduce risk in the most appropriate way and do that in a way that maintains the safety and reliability of the data itself. So this brings me to my ask, and I have one minute, so I'm hopefully on time here. Um, so as you've seen out there in the, in the foyer there, we have, um, there's different sort of um, posters with the asks, um, NWF's ask, my ask of the, of the room here to pose is we have a, a sign-on letter for companies. And this letter um, sets out three key asks that really will help make measurable improvements for tra transparency and traceability within supply chains, particularly in the Brazilian context. Letters broadly uh, supported by Bra Brazilian civil society, by researchers, by academics. Many leading companies have already signed on. If this is something that you, you, you know, think you could be interested in, I would encourage you to come find me and we can talk about it in more detail. Thanks so much, I really appreciate being here. Thank you, Simon. Perfect, perfect modeling of uh, 345. Um, so next up, we're changing tack a little bit. I'm delighted to uh, invite Cynthia Ong uh, to come up and Cynthia, is the executive director for Eversaba, which is one of the leading jurisdictional programs. Uh, you heard uh, Charlotte talk about the importance of jurisdictional programs, I think goal seven, priority seven. So Cynthia, please talk to us about Forever Saba. Thank you. Thank you, Marco, for this surprise uh, invitation. Um, I'm Cynthia from Saba, which is the northernmost state um, on the island of Borneo. We're slightly smaller than Scotland and larger than life in terms of biological diversity. <laughs> um, about 55% of Sabah is forested. Half of that is in protected areas and half of that is production forests. Um, about 70% of that is natural forest management. We're a key producer of crude palm oil, um, about 10% of global supply, 6 million metric tons from about 21% of our land mass. Um, so in 2015, late 2015, the state government endorsed a policy to certify our um, Sabah's palm oil product to 
RSPO standards by 2025. Um, and in 2016, we formed the Jurisdiction Certification Steering Committee, which is equal parts government, civil society, and industry. And we worked very hard on a five-year roadmap to get there, uh, which is now being endorsed by the highest level of government. It means institutional change. It means policy change. It means behavioral change. It means getting rid of our various addictions. Um, so in Sabah, of course, um, palm oil production is very intimately coupled with uh, um, our forest landscape. And so uh, we're realizing that there's a need to uh, um, integrate our transformational processes. So alongside the jurisdiction certification for palm oil, we're also embarking on a 25-year forest management plan for our forest estate. So in the past, we would have um, uh, managed concessions, you know, in this fragmented fashion, and now we're looking at them in, in a holistic manner to uh, begin to orient the, the, our forestry practices into the future. Um, so the two, the two initiatives um, in conjunction cover about 75% of Sabah's land mass. Um, we're at the cusp of endorsing the, the roadmap for, um, you know, getting to, to 2025 um, with fully, a full, fully certified palm oil product and on the cusp of launching the forest management plan. I think we have a, both a symbolic as well as a practical opportunity in Sabah to showcase, uh, you know, um, a transformation in, in a place small enough for it to happen, but also large enough to, um, you know, to show relevant scale. Um, what we need from, from our, our, our neighbors and the international community is stamina and um, commitment, the staying power uh, to walk with, with us through this very, very difficult process. So it's financing, it's practical wisdom, it's taking up this new CSPO product from Saba. Um, yeah, and just uh, hand holding, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cynthia. It's a, it's a really, really extraordinary example of kind of how a jurisdiction program can come together and uh, very, very uh, worthy uh, for everybody's support. So, uh, next up, uh, we're going to change tack a little bit and have the private sector. So, I'm delighted to invite. Dewi Bramono, did I say that right? Uh, uh, who is from APP, one of the largest uh, pulp and paper companies in Indonesia, uh, working on lots of sustainability issues, and also one of the, you're also on the Belantara Foundation board. So, Dewi, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm happy to be able to contribute to this uh, discussion. So, as um, I already mentioned before, I'm from APP, Asia Pulp and Paper. Um, we're a global company for uh, one of the biggest in uh, pulp and paper manufacturing, but we are headquartered in Indonesia. And um, one of the key issues that we are dealing with, of course, is about deforestation. I mean, um, some of you may, may already know that in the last five years, we've been working really hard to turn our story around, especially uh, to specifically about, uh, you know, removing uh, deforestation across our supply chain. Uh, we've done quite a lot of activities uh, 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 with our partners on the ground um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, stuff that we do is related uh, very much with the action plans of uh, that was mentioned earlier, the 10 points. Um, for example, um, you know, for uh, legality issues, we've been working together with the government of Indonesia. Uh, we are one of the uh, leading uh, uh, private sectors that is supporting the piloting of the SBLK system, which is the Timber Legality Verification System of Indonesia, um, to make sure that it is robust and it uh, meets all of the requirements of international uh, stakeholders. And it has been. Uh, it has been um, approved basically by the um, FLECT of EU uh, as their VPA, the um, Voluntary Partnership Agreement, as well as from the uh, Australia um, Illegal Logging uh, Prohibition Act. It has been uh, basically recognized to be uh, robust enough. Um, and we also, um, one of the issues that we're dealing with in uh, 
deforestation in Indonesia, it's a very complex issue and it requires multi-stakeholder engagement in order to be um, implemented and it has to be a landscape level. We cannot think um, you know, uh, based on um, ad administrative boundaries such as uh, concession uh, boundaries of our suppliers, for example. We need to work with um, others, especially communities that uh, live in and around the concession areas. So very quickly after we start uh, the launch of our forest conservation policy, which basically define um, the zero deforestation uh, commitment of APP, we learned that we need to work together with uh, various uh, stakeholders. Um, that is why um, we also think that um, jurisdictional approach is important, and we have started those um, uh, activities. Uh, we begin with two uh, provinces in Indonesia. One is in South Sumatra, and another one is in uh, West Kalimantan. We work closely with the governors. Um, their role is to help us in, uh, you know, identifying uh, other uh, partners on the ground and also uh, identifying what kind of other activities uh, is being done in terms of conservation within those landscapes, so that we can coordinate our activities. Um, reduce, uh, you know, um, overlap of actions and also uh, uh, increase the efficiency of all the um, available resources for conservation. And we've seen benefits in that. Uh, we've had uh, improvement in terms of coordination amongst the various players and we've also identified partners on the ground. And um, in addition to that, um, not just with the with the government, but community is very important, as I mentioned before, uh, because a lot of the threat right now is in relation to um, either um, what called unsustainable uh, efforts from the community when they are trying to do their livelihood. So we've launched our integrated forestry and farming system, um, where we work with the communities to identify alternative livelihood, and we provide them with um, resources and funding to uh, help them develop this. And we cannot do this alone. Um, we are not a conservation organization. Uh, we are pulp and paper manufacturers. So we actually established a foundation called Belantara Foundation. Basically, they are our um, implementation partner for all of our um, conservation activities in the landscape level. And they were established in 2014. And <coughs> through them, we've been able to uh, work with other partners and also do co-funding in the conservation within the various landscape where we are working. Um, so um, the ask that I'm asking for the, t uh, the room here is that uh, we are looking for other partners because we cannot do this alone. No one organization can do it alone. And each one of us have our, our own expertise. And we will like to um, have that uh, engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Dewey. Thank you so much. <clears throat> That's great. So next up, uh, Gillian. Gillian Gladstone from CDP. She leads the North America uh, program on helping companies take deforestation out of their supply chains. So the floor is yours. Thanks, Gillian. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for having me here today. I'm really happy to be speaking to everyone, and um, particularly among this great group of other uh, panelists or askers or <laughs> what, what have you. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a couple of the action points that Charlotta walked us through that are really um, sort of tied closely to then the ask that I have for you. Um, so part of what we at CDP focus on are um, tied to this sort of cluster of uh, the actions at the end. Number eight, mobilizing demand for deforestation-free commodities, particularly in emerging markets. Nine, redirecting finance towards deforestation-free. And then what really underpins that, I think, improving the quality and availability of deforestation, deforestation and supply chain data. So that's really what CDP is all about. It's all about transparency and disclosure. Um, those of you joining us from the climate space, this is climate week after all, so I trust there are probably some in the room. Um, you may know CDP, formerly the Carbon Disclosure Project, for our climate change disclosure platform or carbon data disclosures. Um, that's really become the gold standard in corporate climate reporting. And um, we really drove um, to the, the, led the charge, I guess, in, in enshrining the expectation for corporate GHG emission reporting as a part of business as usual. And that's really what we're doing now in the forest space. Um, we also run a corporate reporting platform on forests. Um, we're the only global disclosure system that works across all the major commodity drivers of deforestation. And what we're really doing in that is incentivizing and supporting action by companies to remove deforestation from their supply chains and operations. 
Um, so we work to help companies report, measure, and manage um, the production and sourcing of those commodities with the, with the end goal of connecting that data to the global marketplace to drive systemic change. And that's what brings us back to those action points. Um, so, but first, just to give you a little context on reporting, always a very exciting, uh, sexy topic. <laughs> so while corporate reporting on deforestation has come a long way, um, there's still a lot of work to be done. So last year, CDP saw just over 200 companies reporting through our disclosure system on their use of deforestation-linked commodities. Um, and this year, we'll have even more than that, which is terrific, number to be announced later this fall, so stay tuned. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's an impressive number of companies, and we're really starting to get to scale in some of these key commodities. But... Uh, we have a long way to go. We've identified about 800 of the largest publicly listed companies in the world that we believe to be exposed to deforestation. So with 200 disclosing so far, you know, we know there's a big gap there that we need to uh, drive some uh, you know, performance on. So this brings me to my ask, which is to help, to ask you to help me uh, by sounding a call for more transparency on how companies are managing risks. Um, and, you know, again, transparency is the key here for empowering investors with critical information about how to make informed decisions and really, you know, back to the action point, redirecting finance towards deforestation-free supply chains. And then, importantly, transparency in supply chains allows companies visibility to implement the commitments they're making, take advantage of the tools at their disposal, which a lot of other folks here are talking about today. So to this end, CDP has launched a supply chain iteration of our information request, which allows large purchasing organizations to collect information from their supply chains. We have a particular focus in this work on commodities produced in Latin America and being sourced or purchased in China. So, um, you know, this is really where, where we're um, sort of entering into this world and trying to push forward action on these two pieces. Um, so, again, just ask you all to help support us in driving transparency. And it's really in this room, these conversations are wonderful, but it's then outside these walls, bringing the message to the 75% of companies that aren't yet reporting and um, you know, may not be part of these conversations day-to-day -day basis the way we are. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. So that's, that's great. We, we live in a world of increasingly radical transparency and how we use that as a tool to drive change is going to be really, uh, really, really important. So CDP's work is, is super key. Um, Ignacio Gavilan, where is Ignacio? Ah. Great. So Ignacio heads up the Environment and Sustainability Program at the Consumer Goods Forum. Uh, I'll let you explain what that is, but a critical partner to TFA and uh, doing some fantastic work in the world. Okay. Thank you, Justin, uh, and thank you for the invitation, even though I'm part of the family, but <laughs> always, uh, always good. So for those of you not familiar with the Consumer Goods Forum, uh, this is an organization that brings together retailers and manufacturers from across the world. We have about 400 members. Uh, some of the very, very large retailers and manufacturers. Uh, three things you should remember. Uh, it focuses on positive change. It's collaborative, which you might think they always get along, but they don't, <laughs> retailers and manufacturers. Uh, and it's CEO-led, which means the decisions come from the top. So the way we operate is through board-approved resolutions, uh, one of them being deforestation, and precisely the Zero Net Deforestation 2020. Uh, so throughout the years, one thing we've been doing is identifying the issues that are relevant for the industry, where collaboration is needed between retailers and manufacturers. <clears throat> and this clearly was, was one of them, along with food waste and health and wellness and some others. Uh, we set up the right partnerships, TFA for example, um, and then uh, the, the, the commitments and the implementation of those commitments. So going back to deforestation, um, we set up this wonderful commitment in 2010. What do we do now? Um, so palm oil, okay, yeah, it's reasonably well known. Um, the RSPO is strong, it's growing uh, back in those days, fine. Paper and pulp, we have FSC and PFC, is a relatively developed market. Cattle has a round table um, on, on sustainable beef. 
but what about soy? What, what the hell is soy? Where is that? So when I ran a little bit of a survey within the membership, I realized that th these poor companies had no clue how to calculate how much soy was in their supply chain. Because it's an ingredient, it's embedded, it's, it appears in many different forms, and the only two forms that appears to you as a consumer is soy milk and edamame in your sushi. <laughs> So, I mean, you have to go really back into your uh, supply chain to understand what it is. So, in order to help the members, we developed what is called the soy ladder. It's a soy footprint mechanism that uh, you can find in our web. Um, it's a very simple tier approach to understand your supply chain uh, and how much soy do you have on it. So, my ask goes to those companies beyond the Consumer Goods Forum to use it to do a materiality assessment and understand how much soy do you have. Because you might be driving deforestation in these areas without knowing it. Uh, the first exercise we did with uh, this soy footprint by four UK retailers, we realized that 30% of the soy they import, they have no clue where it comes from. And that's sad, but it's serious. And we need to understand why 30% in UK retailers is not understood yet. So that's my ask. Go and do your materiality assessment, understand your supply chain, and start reporting as much as you can. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ignacio wins the prize at 3.15. <laughs> so far, that's the, ben that's the new benchmark. Yeah, yeah you but you've finished very quickly within that, that minute gap. So thank you for, for that leading the way, as ever, from the Consumer Goods Forum. Uh, so we're going to stay with the private sector, and Ashley Allen uh, is the new climate and land uh, lead at Mars. Uh, it's great to know Mars even has a climate and land lead, so uh, we're keen to hear all about it. Thank you, Ashley. Right. Thank you. Thanks uh, to the organizers for putting this together. Thanks for all of you um, for being here. I'm going to start with a little quiz on, on Mars, and I'm not talking about the planet, as you probably know, but sometimes when I introduce myself, people <laughs> kind of get a little confused, like, do you work for NASA? Or what? Um, so who consumed a, a Mars product today? You know, Snickers, M&Ms. OK, I see a few hands. Uh, Wrigley gum, Skittles. Did you know that we own those too? OK, now here's the trick part. Whose pet consumed a Mars product today? I'm not talking about feeding your pet M&Ms. I'm talking about pedigree, whiskas. We uh, also produce those brands. So um, when we think about Mars, you probably think about chocolate. You probably think about our cocoa supply chain. But uh, deforestation is obviously also important for us because we do source for our pet care business a lot of beef, a lot of soy. So um, that's just uh, something to kind of consider when you think about a company and what you think you know about a company that's then trying to look at their entire uh, supply chain and finding lots of fun surprises um, <laughs> in different places. Um, so at Mars, maybe if, if you've heard this week, we've been, our, our leadership has been out several events talking about our new sustainable in a generation plan. Uh, we launched that, that last week, but this week has been uh, the place where we've been uh, during climate week marching around and uh, sharing the news. Um, you've probably heard, I think our, our CEO's uh, favorite line is that Mars is not just about uh, doing incrementally better, but we're about uh, doing what's necessary and what's right. And for our sustainability, targets, that means what the science says is necessary and right. So our uh, sustainable in a generation plan includes a science-based climate target for our full value chain. So for those carbon nerds in the audience like me, that scopes one through three uh, with a science-based approach. So that's a really big deal. And our goal is to cut our full value chain emissions by two-thirds by 2050. And to get there, we have to cut by 27% by 2025. So it's a tall order. Um, that's on top of our original operations goals, were to, uh, which are to become uh, net zero um, by 2040. And that really has to do with, with cleaning up our operations and our, our renewable energy. But our value chain footprint is 76% of it is from the agriculture and land use change uh, aspects of, of our value chain. So that's really our, our focus now moving forward is figuring out how, how do we do that. And I think a lot of people in the room here are going to help us figure that out. Um, 
I also want to mention just specifically on deforestation, you know, we, we joined several of the companies, joined the Consumer Goods Forum in, in uh, putting forward um, commitments related to ending deforestation in, in our key supply chains, and we've also been working a lot on that in the cocoa supply chain. Um, but now deforestation is fully integrated into our climate change, into our CO2 target. So um, the accounting that goes into that is uh, really necessitates looking at land use change and the impact factors associated with land use change when you're calculating your footprint. So that's a big deal and I would say a, a key ask then is um, both to companies and to organizations that work with companies, uh, help other companies also work on accounting for that deforestation within their climate targets. A lot of us are making quantified climate targets <laughs> By putting deforestation into that target, we are now better able to track that in a holistic way within our full climate goal. So that's that's kind of my number one ask. Um, and and then one more ask that I'll give is, um, you know, to the experts in the room. I think we've talked a lot about improving data, improving uh, improving the analysis. Um, also, help us really really understand the drivers of deforestation because we're making commitments based on our purchase of commodities. <laughs> But we know that there are lots of complex factors in countries where we source from having to do with governance and enforcement, um, having to do with uh, other commodities like timber production. And so really help us understand that because we can't reach our goals unless we are working with others so that they can also address those uh, drivers. Um, so I'll just end since uh, this week was uh, the launch of climate optimism. I'll, I'll end with an optimistic story, um, and that is to help us not forget uh, why uh, we're doing this. Um, so a friend of mine has three-year-old twins, and he was talking to them, and they had must have done something at preschool about what they wanted to be when they grew up. And his one daughter told him, uh, I want to be an astronaut, um, but only boys are astronauts, Daddy. And, and so he went to some friends at NASA. He works in DC, uh, as I do, and um, got a signed picture from one of the women astronauts at uh, NASA and gave it to her and and she was just elated and her mind was blown that she could actually be an astronaut So I think we should just keep in mind that we are doing this for future generations in addition to our own generation And that we're also going to need the scientific expertise and the passion from these future generations to continue making uh, To continue working toward this goal Thank you, Thank you Ashley uh, so, uh, great reminder about how important it is we work together and some of the complexities that no single company, even a big company like Mars, can actually solve this. So, thank you for that reminder. So, uh, I'm going to hand now to Dasono uh, Hatono, who is really one of the leaders in this space. He's working on an incredibly important landscape project in central Kalimantan, uh, the CEO of, this, uh, of the company, Kating the Katingan Project. So. The floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Justin. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm Darsono Hartono. I'm actually from Indonesia. I used to work here. So about 10 years ago, I started this endeavor, being convinced by my business partner, Rezal Kusumat Maja, saying that, Darsono, you save rainforest, you're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> so I'm like, wow. I mean, I, I actually work four blocks from here. I used to work for JP Morgan in real estate. So I mimic that real estate, <laughs> rainforest. That makes probably, I mean, of course, Al Gore sort of put, this is 10 years ago, right? So, I mean, even somebody like Charlotte, we are like the old people here when we start talking about Red Plus. But um, I think those are the, 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 the experience that I had the past 10 years teach me so much about what we can achieve if we want to do the right thing. I mean, uh, my business partner wrote an article op ad before Bali Cop said, Land dictates the rule, communities are the gatekeeper. So those are the basic premises of how we worked 10 years ago. If you read that article again, it's the same thing that we've been doing. So the reality is some people keep on talking about it. Some people decided to do something about it. So we are probably the one who is doing it. I know there are some other people doing it too. But I think from a, my perspective, looking at this earlier on as a climate issue, it actually become a commun commun uh, communities issue. Because at the end, it's the communities that deforest. At the end, you're not looking at the currency carbon, but you're looking at how you can manage these communities. So from our endeavor of trying to protect, now we have to work into how to produce with these communities with the basic premises of not deforesting. So that's why the business model sort of like changed over the past five years. And I think, you know, you see like what we do well the past 10 years, we do everything by the book. So, you know, we, we know that there's a lot of land conflict, 
we have done pre prior informed consent where there is no such principle than 10 years ago. So things are, I think we both believe that we have to do as a, as a new generation for Indonesian who want to do it. And luckily, we have peatlands, which is a, a gift and a curse because if you don't manage it well, it becomes a curse. If you manage it well, hopefully you can make money. So we have that whole dynamics with us. And, um, and 10 years passed, I think the proof of concept worked on the ground. We've been working with 34 villages, 43,000 communities. We have implementing, we basically start building up the institution, how we can work together with them. We have done all the participating map exercise to avoid land conflict. You know, we have actually worked with the consumer goods company right now, a big consumer goods company, uh, CGF Group company, to look into potential of, we have some coconut sugar, uh, coconut plantation outside the, 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 the concession. But concession is about 157,000 hectares, so it's a huge concession, 100 kilometers north to south. 30, you know, 30 kilometers west to east. But outside that boundary, we still have a lot of coconut plantation that we work with the big company to add value. How we can produce, not only getting copra, but getting co you know, coconut sugar. So those are the things that we have done well. We have built, basically our company have been doing, have been able to build a social capital to bring trust. It's very hard to, to, gain, to gain trust from communities if you work in Indonesia. So I think the ask that we want is, you know, with all the hard work that we have, we finally get our credit, you know, verified. We have more than 15 million tons of credit. So if anybody, any of you have <laughs> somebody you know or you're interested to buy credit, you can contact me. But I think, but the, the lesson learned is without, it's not, you have, we have to prove the concept of protecting forests can give benefit. People start talking about pushing production then become protection, but it doesn't work that way. I personally don't believe that you, know, you can push production all the way and you think that protection will be taken care of. It's impossible. I'll give you a small example why. In Riau, if somebody doing palm oil, you increase their productivity, they're going to get two wives, three wives. You know, they're going to have one car, two cars. And what will they do? They want to get more land. That's the reality. You can, you can increase them now, but in the future, you're going to have problems. But if you can make an uh, argument saying that if you protect this, you're going to get some benefit, or at, not as good, but there's some benefit to it, then it might change their mindset. So that's all I ask. Thank you. Pak Tasuna, thank you so much. It genuinely is one of the sort of great projects that's out there that I would encourage all of you to learn more about. And part of this is actually to encourage exchange. And so, Ashley, to your question, around the drivers and the understanding, this is not a climate story, it is a community story, as Pat Latorno says, and so I would suggest you have a discussion when we go into the break later, because I think there's a lot that, 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 that they, a lot of knowledge uh, that's been built up. So we're gonna change tack again, uh, and I'm gonna ask uh, Stina Rechten uh, to, to say a few words. Stina is the, uh, the private sector lead and the TFA tag for the Norwegian uh, uh, International Climate and Forestry Initiative, and I don't think that needs any introduction, but one of the most important players in terms of keeping this agenda alive. So, Stina, thank you. Hi, everyone. So, I'm Stina Rexton, and I'm actually new to NICFI, the and to the Norwegian government forest work, and to the forest world in general. So, first, I have a personal ask, which is, please don't use any abbreviations. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about um, how to leverage private sector capital for some of our common priorities going forward that have to do with reforestation, which we need to do if we want to achieve the climate goals, and uh, just preserving the forest we already have. Um, so, and I want to talk about love uh, at the end, if there is time. So we'll see. So uh, I guess we're all interested in using, uh, leveraging private capital flows in a greener way. Uh, we're recognizing that um, it is market mechanisms that have driven some of the deforestation over these past decades. And we want to use those same market forces to drive reforestation or forest restoration uh, and preservation of forests. And um, 
for that to happen, we need creative ideas, we need innovation. So one of the things, one of the asks from my side is how um, can we use private sector innovation and how can we use market forces to drive reforestation? What we're lacking is scalable business models, essentially. So how do we promote that innovation in restoration? And um, the other ask um, has to do with um, this new fund that we've launched in July of this year. So it's completely new. It's called the And Green Fund. Um, we launched it with IDH and Unilever and the GEF. Um, we're so far the single biggest contributor to the fund. It's a 400 million US dollar fund, uh, blended finance. So essentially, um, we want to use the fund to redirect finance flows in agribusiness in a greener way. The fund um, basically works in two ways. Uh, it encourages jurisdictions to up their standards by um, having to become eligible for the fund. So we approve jurisdictions for the fund. And um, it also um, helps mitigate some of the risk for forward-leaning private sector actors that want to, want to invest in a, in a greener way. Um, so it's $400 million, but um, the ratio private public money is um, is uh, one in four, so it's 1.6 billion US dollars of private money for the 400 million of blended finance. And um, I, I'm running out of time, so we won't have time to talk about love. But because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I really want to talk about love and finance at the same time. Uh, I guess the ask here is twofold. One, we want to other big donors for the fund. And two, we want really good projects into the pipeline because um, it's more than about the 1.6 billion plus 400 million US dollars. It's about proving a new business model, right? And thereby sustainably redirecting finance in a greener way. Thank you. I think we should give you an extra 30 seconds to talk about love. That's, that's, uh, that's my own intervention I'm making. <laughs> okay, well, we're all here from different parts of the public-private sector divide and from different academic disciplines, from different worlds. But we're all also different people. So I just want to encourage everyone to take their personality into the job that we're doing. Uh, we tend to be so left-minded in our work, you know, very kind of results-focused and uh, brainy, which is a great thing. But I uh, uh, want to encourage everyone or ask everyone to also lead from the heart. So the combine the heart and the mind, because that's what we need if we really want to get where we want to get. Peace and love. Wow. Um, thank you, Shanina. That, that was, that was uh, great, and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, we're only going to change things if we change the way we relate to each other and to nature. So thank you. Um, so Katie, Katie McCoy, many of you know her, um, formerly of CDP leading all of the forest work, and now at the very cool Partnership for Forests that uh, Diffid has set up in the UK. So, Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And it's really great to see friends and colleagues in the room. So, uh, under my, in my new hat. Well, I'm not wearing a hat today, but, <laughs> well, you know, you can visualise the hat. So, for those of you who don't know um, Partnerships for Forests, we are a five-year programme, £56 million grant and, te grant and technical assistance programme. So what we, and we're working in three regions globally that are critical to the world's forests. So Western Central Africa, East Africa, and Southeast Asia. 
Simply put, what we're trying to do is halt deforestation through catalyzing investments in sustainable um, land use and forests. We all know, uh, everyone in the room will know that there are short-term economic gains um, for conversion or degradation of forests that often not, than not far outweigh cons conservation or keeping forest standing or, or restoration activities. And P4F, or Partnerships of Forests, in, in full, is challenging this um, business-as-usual model. So I'm really pleased to follow Stina's comments because that business-as-usual challenging, that business-as-usual is really what um, we're also trying to do here at Partnerships of Forests by incubating partnerships and supporting business models where all key actors, so we're talking public sector, private sector, and communities, really importantly, in a, in a partnership to generate attractive returns for all, all concerned in the partnership through building, restoring, or conserving natural capital. I'm really thrilled to see that the agenda that's been outlined today complements and aligns with so many of the priorities that Partnerships for Forest has today. Um, and I you know, without Justin jumping up here and dragging me off, I can't talk about all of them. So what I thought I would do is just focus on one of them. So um, the increasing sustainable livelihoods in the palm and cocoa, se cocoa sector for smallholders. And we're here at Partnerships for Forest. I'm, um, you know, our Western Central Africa portfolio is probably the one where I could uh, draw um, the, the most illustration of, of the work we're doing to support this particular priority. In palm oil, we supported the um, Africa Palm Oil Initiative. I've avoided the acronym for Stina <laughs> to avoid the many acronyms in this space. Um, and what we're doing there is supporting the, um, bringing those principles from the national and regional level to, to what's happening on the ground. We're also, on the project side, supporting um, a, uh, a project with Unilever on, out, on an outgrower scheme, working with um, the Forestry Commission in central Ghana, as well as um, local chiefs and um, farmers cooperative. So really getting the sense of all of the actors that need to be in that partnership. In COCO, we've supported the framework for action to end deforestation in um, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana and um, at the policy level. At the project level, we're supporting some really innovative um, partnerships, um, here, particularly in Ghana. We've got a, pro a program with Tuton, a cocoa company in Ghana, which is working on a uh, landscape governance framework, which is very innovative and new. We're also supporting OLAM um, and Rainforest Alliance in a partnership to be able to um, to be able to secure sustainable livelihoods uh, for for communities there, so smallholder farmers can adapt and mitigate the the worst effects of climate change, as well as protect biodiversity in the Sioux Forest Reserve. So. If I may, I have two asks, because I have one minute, and I'm going to take Stina's advice and bring my personality to the first ask. The first ask is, um, we want you to send us your unicorns. Now, oh, a little bit of my personality. What I mean by unicorns, we want you to send us, we want you to come to us with you know, ideas for public, private, and community partnerships that have the potential to be to scale, to, to be scaled, to become you know, business um, models that can be replicated to, um, to, to really um, drive further investment into sustainable land use and be replicated to become viable businesses. So please send us your unicorns, come and talk to us afterwards. And secondly, um, as we're at Climate Week and I've heard lots of inspirational um, speak, uh, speakers um, and, uh, and I really feel like collaboration is the buzzword. We've, I've heard a lot of collaboration. We'd like to collaborate with um, those of you in the room that are interested in learning lessons from what we're doing right now to really secure the legacy of some of the great work that we're doing. So collaborating in knowledge products that's really going to secure that legacy and make sure that the work we're doing has, has a long life. So those are my two asks. Thank you. Thank you. So... How are we all doing? We've got a couple more interventions, uh, and then we're going to watch a little film. So uh, Nicole, Nicole Pastrika from uh, Rainforest Alliance. Hi, we haven't nice met. To meet you. Yeah, nice <laughs> to meet you. <laughs> we didn't get a I'm chance Nicole. to meet before, uh, but Rainforest Alliance doesn't need any introduction. The you know leading certification and all sorts of wonderful things around the world. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thought today I would uh, focus on three initiatives that seem to align the most with the TFA priorities. Um, the three initiatives I wanted to mention that we're working on are the Accountability Framework Initiative, um, the Landscape Standard Initiative, and our Sustainable Districts Platform Initiative. So the first one um, relates mainly to Priority 10. Of course, it's cross-cutting, but the priority focused on improving quality and, and availability of data. 
So the Accountability Framework Initiative um, was created by a consortium of NGOs, of which we are one, and this is in direct response to these 2020 commitments. The accountability framework is not in and of itself a standard or a certification. Instead, it is trying to align definitions and norms, for example, concepts like forests or zero deforestation, to help companies effectively navigate this landscape of existing implementation tools and also to ensure comparability and accountability across supply chains, which I heard were some of the asks already mentioned today. The framework is closely aligned with other regional initiatives, like CFA also already described. Um, and it will have several output products very soon that you may be interested in um, participating in and using. So the first is the core document. This document will provide guidance on common definitions, norms, and credible requirements for deforestation commitments, monitoring, verification, and reporting. And a second complementary document to be um, released in 2018 will be an operational manual. And this will provide more detailed guidance by commodity or region um, for producers and supply chains that are working here. Finally, the team um, on the accountability framework will also be conducting a scoping exercise um, to better understand the needs of the financial sector in particular, so that was mentioned as well, um, to see what you need to help mitigate investment risks and in line the uh, core document and the operational manual with um, your ESG strategies. So our ask here is um, that you participate in the public consultation of the core document. It will be ready for public consultation starting October 1st. And um, you can uh, contribute through the website, which is Accountability Framework. We have some flyers here with that on it, or uh, through um, outreach events that will be conducted in the regions. There are also working groups being established for different thematic areas, such as land use, or um, verification and monitoring. So if you're interested in contributing in a more direct uh, way, then you could um, connect with us on that. And my colleague, Adrian Stork, who is uh, working in the Secretariat for Accountability Framework is here and you can speak with her directly as well. So the second, the last two uh, initiatives are relating more to priority six. So this has uh, already been discussed as well, some accelerating implementation of jurisdictional approaches. So the first one is our landscape standard. So Rainforest Alliance is working with VCS to develop and pilot an outcomes-based sustainable landscapes framework, which we are calling the landscape standard. It is launching in October 2017, so very soon. This will be a framework for assessing and demonstrating progress towards sustainable outcomes in productive landscapes using a core set of environmental, social, and economic indicators. It will include tools for stakeholders in the landscape, like governments, like producers, like companies, to define and align their sustainability priorities for that landscape, implement action plans, and report on progress. The, all this with the goal of driving finance and demand to those, um, to those uh, jurisdictions. So the landscape standard, my ask, is that it will be piloted starting this year in Peru, Mexico, Chile, Costa Rica, Guatemala, and Ghana. So if you're operating in any of those locations um, where we will be, then you may be able to participate. It will also have a global and local advisory committees, and we will start recruiting for the global advisory committee in October if you're interested in participating in that. So um, very briefly and finally, uh, our initiative relating to the Sustainable Districts platform. Um, this is a jurisdictional approach to smallholder capacity building, which was one of the other priorities in Indonesia, where eight district leaders in Riau, North and South Sumatra, Jambi, and West Kalimantan have pledged to join this platform, which is a caucus of government association of district leaders there. So working with partners, um, we're collaborating to protect forests there while also ensuring sustainable economic growth, growth and incorporating mainstream sustainable land practices um, into the district's planning process. So my ask for this is, um, it's a very ambitious program targeting up to uh, 50,000 smallholder farmers in these eight districts by 2022. So there are opportunities to join the platform program to lend your expertise, uh, funding, or participate in the land planning processes. And for companies with specific commitments to smallholders, um, there's an opportunity to leverage the existing funding uh, by making your own investment tied to a specific district, uh, a certain number of smallholders, or your own uh, company outcome goals. So those are my many asks. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to present them. We look forward to chatting more. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you.
So, uh, so last, I'm going to ask Michael to come back up. Uh, uh, I think you're making a brief ask and then introducing the film. Is that right? Yeah, I'm going to do something else. Oh, you're gonna, good. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I'm going to break my four minutes up into two segments. I'm just going to introduce the film for a second, and then I'm going to do the ask at the end, because I think it'll make more sense. But um, I want to bring the love back into the room and to remind us of why we love the force that we care about. Um, so uh, earlier this year, we took a trip up to visit with one of our partners, our indigenous communities that we work with in the in the Amazon region, the uh, the Yawanawa, and um, it was an amazing journey. Uh, Acre is in the far western part of Brazil, so it's about a 50-hour trip from start to end, and it involves uh, about a nine and a half hour boat ride. Um, but what was interesting about it was really, and I'm a trained tropical forester, so what was really interesting during this journey was seeing the difference between the quality of the forest as you go from government-owned land to communities that are rivering communities to these indigenous cultures. And I think that's a reminder of why indigenous peoples are such a critical piece of the puzzle that we're trying to construct here. 25% of the world's tropical forests are owned and managed by indigenous communities. And we were able to do some research some years back to demonstrate that they are the best managers of those forests, better than governments, better than, than businesses. So they, they need to be a real partner in this process. So we've got a, a short film, uh, about 10 minutes. We, uh, on the trip, we brought along uh, Greenpoint Innovations and Marty Hoffman is over there in the corner. and. Um, and I'm, I'd like you to, to feast your eyes on, on why, we, uh, why we love these forests, and then I'm going to come back with an ask. We should all care because we are all the same people. We are all connected. We share the same future. And at this point, they turn to a video called Stewards of the Forest, which you can find just by Googling that or via the show notes for episode 23 at bionic-planet.com. I'll use this little pause to also remind you again that if you like Bionic Planet and want more of it, especially the value-added episodes, then be sure to give me a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you access podcasts, or support me by taking a free 30-day audiobook trial at Audible Trial. That's Audible, like, you know, I hear it, audibletrial.com forward slash bionicplanet. And that's Bionic Planet as a single word with no dots, dashes, or spaces. So audibletrial.com forward slash Bionic Planet. Or you can become a patron and support me directly for as little as $1 per month. You can learn how to do that at bionic-planet.com. That's bionic-planet.com. A little bit different from the Audible Trial address. So, um, you know, when I describe this trip, and I, I think many of us have probably gone and visited with uh, communities like this in different parts of the world, but, but what's wonderful is that it sort of brings the magic back into it. You really remember all of those things, and it's so sensual as an experience when you, when you are, are taking time there. It, it's meant to be sort of self-contained in terms of the message, but just to kind of draw the thread back to this conversation and the... Uh, Agenda 2020, 10 commandments, or I mean the 10 priorities, um, is, um, you know, you have, uh, you have this, you know, let's keep the mind frame of a full landscape, if you would. And on one side, you have all of these drivers of deforestation, which is expanding agricultural frontiers. It's natural. It's infrastructure. It's all these kinds of things. But on the other side, you have these stewards, um, and, and as I said, a quarter of the world's tropical forests are owned or managed by indigenous and local communities. So, so it's a very big piece of the puzzle to be thinking about. And we have ways to think about supply chains that are gonna be valuable to them. So I, I completely agree with what you were saying, which is I think it's a false structure if we say we're gonna have production on one half and then we're gonna have kind of con nothing happening on the other side of the frontier. We need to find ways to, to invest in forest-based supply chains that are sustainable, that are things like artisan products that the women in these communities are producing that are 
in high demand all around here in New York City. And the agricultural products like the acai that, that, that can also be there. So I want us to, you know, my ask is to keep our, keep our frame right when we think about the, the uh, set of different kinds of activities that we need to be doing together. And um, as the la last couple of the speakers, Tina and the others were saying, part of that responsibility to be successful is, is gonna be on us. We've gotta take off our institutional hats. It's not us against them and them against them. If we can't take off our institutional hats and really work effectively as a group, we're never gonna get there. Um, I spent 10 years in the foundation world watching the NGO community fight amongst each other. And I, and I just, we cannot do that anymore going forward. So I really appreciate the leadership of TFA, of, uh, of the partners that are here, and, and I'm gonna really lean heavily on and with you, Marco, to make sure that we can be successful at what we're trying to do here, which is a very ambitious and urgent plan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael, and, uh, and thank you to uh, Stephen and Martin for a fantastic film. They're both over there. I'm sure it'd be great to chat with them uh, in the break as well. So uh, we're running up against 6 o'clock. We're not going to have a kind of big plenary discussion or lots of Q&A now, but what I hope we've done is stimulate you all to be thinking about all of the various parts of this 10 uh, point plan, there's 10 priorities that, that Charlotte laid out. Um, and each of the organizations that stood up has made an ask, and the, uh, the TFA team is just going to uh, put up some of these asks, uh, just so you can see them as a sort of prompt again uh, that we'll just flick through um, before we go into a break. Um, I certainly am not going to try and summarize everything that's been said, but I hope what we all take away from it is that we've all got something we can contribute. From whatever our institutional perch and whatever our personal passion is, this is a critical agenda. You wouldn't be in the room now if you didn't believe that. But what we want you to do, we're putting, handing out some post-its now, we want each of you to think about two things. What's your contribution? What can you make, right? And then how can you answer some of the asks that have been made, okay? And whether that's at the personal level and the personal passion, the love that Stina brought into the room in a very, very powerful way, uh, or whether it's the work you're doing and the organization that you sit in and the work you're doing, so what we want to do is rather than sort of just break now, we want to have just a couple of minutes of reflection, of quiet. You're allowed to write, or you can just sit quietly. Oh, that's a phone going off. That's bad. Um, but we just want a couple of minutes of peace. If you've had a week anything like me, there have not been many gaps in the week. And it's just nice to just take a little time to reflect on this kind of incredibly complex agenda. And then we're going to go into the atrium over there, and we're gonna discuss the ask. And I want you to be speaking to people you don't know and to be uh, networking and actually really figuring out what can you offer to others in the room. The TFA have termed this, have come up with this new term, I'm gonna try and say it, the ask trium, right? Which I guess is what you take when you take an atrium and you put lots of asks in an atrium. Uh, and that's what the next two hours are. So half of this whole session is then gonna be outside for us to really have those networks. So uh, I'm gonna stop now with just a thank you where I started, a thank you to Forest Trends. Thank you for putting that film together, if nothing else. It's, it's, it's always amazing to see the work with indigenous peoples anywhere uh, in the world. They teach us so much about what it is to live close to the land and find a new relationship with each other and with the land. And a huge thank you to Marco, uh, to Petra, to Anna, uh, and to the TFA Secretariat, because they're a tiny team and they're doing a fantastic job of pulling these partnerships together because we're only going to figure it out by working together. So thank you to, uh, to all of you for your leadership. So a couple of minutes of quiet reflection to use as you wish, but please just stay here and just reflect on what we've heard, the film, 
the asks, and then we'll go and have a great networking discussion. So two minutes of just a little quiet time. And on that note, we'll wrap up this edition of Bionic Planet. Again, if you're a paying patron, I'm not charging for this one. You could say it's compliments of Forest Trends because I put this together on their time. And by the way, I do encourage you to visit the Forest Trends website. I spend a lot of time here covering the work that other organizations do, but Forest Trends is working hard and effectively to save forests around the world, usually by tackling the economic drivers of deforestation. You can also visit Ecosystem Marketplace, which is my full-time gig. There we get a little more technical than I do in the podcast, but if I've sparked your curiosity here, you might find it worthwhile to go digging around. Until next time, I'm Steve Zwick, coming to you today from Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Thanks for listening.